Good evening. My name is Richard Hitt, and I'm the president of the Wild Ones Middle Tennessee Chapter. Wild Ones is a national nonprofit organization that has over 60 local chapters. We support the use of native plants in the landscape, as well as the use of sustainable landscaping practices. I would like to welcome everyone to our September 2020 monthly chapter meeting. Tonight, we are delighted to have Cooper Breeden as our feature speaker. Cooper recently received his master's degree in biology from Austin Peay State University. In addition to being our chapter's founding treasurer, Cooper works for the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative as their conservation coordinator. So take it away, Cooper. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, so I'm Cooper Breeden, as you said. Uh, I am a, the conservation coordinator for the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. I know that a lot of you have, uh, you saw me um, give this presentation about a year ago. I think that you've seen probably Dwayne Estes either in, at Wild Ones or somewhere else. Uh, Dwayne Estes started the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. Uh, he's presented at Wild Ones and a lot of other places. Um, so a lot of you are probably familiar with who the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative is, but I figured for those who are new to it, I'd give a, a really brief introduction to what it is. But essentially, uh, SGI is, has a mission to conserve, restore, and promote native grasslands of all types throughout the Southeast. Um, so we were started, we're based out of Austin Peay State University in Clarksville, Tennessee. Uh, we cover a, a large region, you can see here, uh, and cover, encompasses um, about, or at least part of 23 different states. Uh, and so because we work technically all over this region, uh, we really rely on partnerships with a lot of different agencies and organizations to get our work done. We're still relatively new, under five years old, and so still growing. Uh, we have several coordinators uh, throughout Tennessee uh, and a couple coming up in other states uh, relatively soon. And one of my roles at SGI is to coordinate the Tennessee Plant Conservation Alliance. And so I've been in this position for two years uh, I was hired to coordinate this network. And so the Tennessee Plant Conservation Alliance is a coalition of organizations and individuals dedicated to pr promoting and conserving Tennessee's botanical lands. Um, I figured it might be helpful to explain a little bit about how I see this organized. So this is a really horrible graphic of an umbrella. Um, but the way that I see it is the Tennessee Plant Conservation Alliance uh, is not meant to function as a standalone organization or nonprofit or anything like that. It's meant to be more of a loose network of all sorts of different partners, from volunteers to agencies, researchers, nonprofits, whoever it may be. And so this is just a few uh, different agencies and organizations I have listed here under this greater umbrella of plant conservation that we call the Tennessee Plant Conservation Alliance. Um, some of these, there'd be others here for other projects, but some of these are, or most of these are relevant to a project that I'm going to talk a lot about in this presentation. Um, but um, you, we have a couple nonprofits here, the Strawberry Plains Audubon Center, which is actually in Mississippi, but they work region-wide as well. And so they um, ha can be, serve as a partner in different ways, especially for West Tennessee species. I have the Nashville Zoo here. Uh, University of Memphis, and then there's also room for, or uh, governments also play a big role, whether it's through state governments like the Tennessee Division of Natural Areas, sorry my dog is trying to jump on me, um, or through city governments like the Lickerman Nature Center, part of Memphis um, museums. And then of course volunteers play a big role and we want to continue to promote uh, different volunteer opportunities because uh, I think that there's a lot of space for volunteerism uh, in the whole world of plant conservation. And so back to the topic at hand, uh, I'm going to talk about how we prevent the extinction of rare plants in Tennessee and beyond. So I say and beyond uh, because obviously we all know that plants are not going to obey most of our political boundaries. Uh, I think most of the rare plants we have you probably find in other states, some of our bordering states, not all of them. Um, but one of the things I want to mention is I want to bring up this organization and this publication. So the Center for Plant Conservation is a global organization and they also uh, work globally in plant conservation. It's sort of like a global PCA, but their mission is to ensure stewardship of imperiled native plants. And they do this through a large network of researchers, 
all different sorts. They've been working for decades. Um, but one of their main goals that they strive to do is release a lot of um, the lessons learned, I guess, of different conservationists and distill them so that it's useful to the larger plant conservation community. And last year they released this, this beast of a book it's called Best Practices for uh, Cons... Sorry, I can't see this windows in my way. Best Plant Conservation Practices to Support Species Survival in the Wild. Um, and so this is really the culmination of uh, a lot of work by a lot of different researchers and conservationists from all over the world. And it's kind of distills a lot of this research into some guidelines on how to go about a uh, successful conservation, plant conservation project. So a lot of what I'll present here is some of what's included in there. Uh, this kind of serves as the Bible for anyone doing any sort of plant conservation, especially if it involves uh, propagation or introductions or reintroductions of plants, um, things like that, seed collecting. And so a lot of what I have, uh, I, I consider this or refer to this on a weekly basis um, as I work with other partners to implement some of these projects. Um, one of the things, this is a weird picture of an airplane. Um, this is something I just grabbed really quickly, but I want to, I want to mention it because one of the big considerations in any sort of conservation project is not just considering the conservation of a species, but considering the conservation of each of the populations of that species. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, if you have ever taken biology or ecology, uh, at some point you probably heard this analogy that has to do with ecological destruction, where they use the analogy of airplane rivets. And so if you were to take any of these rivets out of these airplanes, you take a few of them out of there, um, it's probably not going to affect the airplane much. But eventually, as you remove more and more rivets, basically representing different species, then eventually you're going to have ecosystem collapse. Uh, and I think you can think of it the same way for uh, the conservation of any individual species. Um, if you lose one or two populations of any species, uh, it might not hurt the species overall, but as you lose more and more populations, eventually that eventually you're gonna the species is gonna go extinct, and so it's important to consider uh, a plant's distribution and all of its populations as you're um, working towards any conservation project for that species. And so I'll address some of that um, as I go through the pr presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk about really this one species as an illustration of all of the different best management practices and guidelines. Uh, this is Helianthus verticillatus, or the world sunflower. It's a federally endangered species. It's uh, considered critically imperiled. It's building five populations worldwide. This map down here at the bottom is not up to date, um, but we have two populations in West Tennessee. You can see three counties highlighted there. One of those has actually been extirpated. It was the original population found in the late 1800s that hasn't been seen since, so it's probably extirpated. So we've got two left in West Tennessee. There's one population that's down on that Alabama-Georgia border. Uh, there's another one in northern Mississippi, and then there's one that was recently found, I think it was two years ago, in actually Virginia. And so it's got kind of a weird distribution. Um, but all of them, so there's two that are on protected land, uh, but really only one of those is doing well. Um, it's a Nature Conservancy easement in Georgia. Um, and it's, it's a large area in the Coosa Valley. Um, and it, apparently that population is doing extremely well. I'd love to go visit it someday. I haven't been there myself. But all of the other populations we have um, are extremely threatened by really any sort of threat that you can consider. So whether it's invasive species, agriculture, erosion, pesticide, or not pesticide, herbicide, um, genetic uh, barriers, all sorts of different things. This, this thing has everything working against it. Uh, most of the places you find it, in Tennessee and Mississippi at least, and in Alabama, are roadsides. Uh, not even any roadsides that are particularly special. It's mostly just weedy species or a lot of invasive species even. Um, you find it on the edges of ditches that are eroding, the ones that have just a, a drop off down a clay embankment. Um, or you find it um, on the edge of like soybean fields or different ag fields. And so really all of these populations are really just struggling to hold on. Uh, this is a different distribution map. Shows, uh, I like this one because I have the protected land in, on here. 
uh, in addition to the, the four occurrences that we see there. So that, that red, all of those red polygons on that map are different kinds of protected areas. So that could be state parks, uh, state natural areas, wildlife management areas, state forests, uh, probably forgetting some there. But those are all different protected lands. And then those orange dots, some of them are kind of hard to see, are where the plant occurs. And you'll notice that there's no overlap between the two. There's one that's close, that's Pinson Mound State Park uh, up there in Madison County. It's close, um, but it's not quite overlapping. And so this is, a, this is considered a threat for the species. It's not on any protected land, which means we can't really, um, we don't really have any say on how the population is managed or how the habitat is managed. And it's hard to support any sort of conservation of these species, except for working with, uh, if we happen to be able to work with any of the private landowners that have it on their land. And so uh, one of the things to consider, since this is a federally endangered species, is that um, it will, uh, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service will develop a recovery plan for it. And in that recovery plan will be specific parameters on uh, what needs to happen to remove it from the endangered species list. And because this really doesn't occur on any sort of intact um, protected land, it'll automatically inclu include introductions of different sorts. So any sort of recovery plan will entail collecting seed from these native populations, growing it out and introducing it into protected land somewhere, whether it's state park or something else. Um, and so right now, yeah, so right now we don't have any unprotected land. I'm gonna go talk a little bit about this, the biology of this species because it adds um, some more complicating factors. So a lot of sunflowers, including this species, are obligate outcrossers, which means they can only breed with other individuals of the species. So a lot of species, for instance, you could, uh, if pollen from a flower of one individual can uh, land on the pistil of that same flower and it can self, it can, it can breed with itself essentially and produce seed. Uh, the world sunflower is not like that. Uh, it has to pollinate other individuals. You have to have pollen from one plant going to the pistil of another plant in order for it to produce seed. Um, and so not only do we have very few populations, but in all of our, at least West Tennessee and uh, Northern Mississippi populations, they're all extremely small uh, with just a handful of individuals. One of them may potentially even only have one individual, which means it can't reproduce at least without some sort of outside interaction. Um, and so in the long run, uh, these small populations eventually are likely to lose their genetic diversity and over, over the long run, over the long haul, this will reduce the likelihood of its survival because it won't have the genetic diversity to really adapt to the site or the changing conditions at the site. And so I'm going to use this species as a illustration for um, some of these best management practices and some of what we consider um, when trying to restore the species. And so most of this work has not been done yet. It's all relatively new. This is all a pretty new conversation that I've been working with Division of Natural Areas um, and a lot of other different partners to figure how, what we need to do to bring this species back from the edge of extinction. And so thinking of it in these different steps, so we have seed banking, propagation, site preparation, introduction, and then monitoring and management. Some of those, it doesn't always necessarily happen in that order. It really depends on the partners and the species and a lot of different factors. Um, but for us and for this species, it kind, it kind of probably will happen in that order. So we've just now this year, uh, actually in previous years, we've started collecting seed for it. But then going into the future, um, we're going to pick a few sites and start to manage the habitat in those sites and prepare the sites so that in a couple years, perhaps in 2022, we can actually introduce some propagules, some small seedlings of the sunflower into those sites. Um, and then hopefully monitor it over the years and hopefully see it uh, be successful and thrive. So I'm going to go through each of those and show at least how they apply here and things that we consider as we're working on these projects at these various stages. So first I want to talk about seed collection and seed banking. 
there's a lot to consider with this. Um, some of it is obvious and some of it is not so obvious and you don't think about until you're actually in the field. Um, but one of the things to consider is, does the species have an orthodox seed? So an orthodox seed is, is, has a technical term. It's basically a seed that can survive uh, desiccation. And so an orthodox seed, this is a, it, it does have an orthodox seed, but um, so a sunflower, you would dry, um, you go through a process of processing the seed and drying it before you put it in long-term storage in a freezer. Um, and so what an orthodox seed is, is one that you can dry to a certain amount so that when you put it in the freezer, the water is not gonna expand and destroy the seed. Uh, there are seeds that can't withstand that. Uh, if you dry them to a certain degree that is necessary for freezing them, then, it'll, then they'll die and they won't be viable anymore. Um, those are called rec uh, recalcitrant seeds. And all oak, oaks have recalcitrant, tree, recalcitrant seeds, um, a number of other species. But this sunflower has an orthodox seed and um, I think has pretty minimal uh, specifications for storing it. Uh, you obviously need to know the phenology of the species. So that's the seasonality, when it flowers, um, how long its flowering period is, when it's gonna go to fruit and go to seed. Uh, you need to know those things before you go out in the field. For someone like me who, I live in Nashville and have to drive four hours to Northern Mississippi to collect it. It's a bummer when you get out there and realize the seed's not, collect, the seed's not going to be collected. So this is an important consideration, it saves a lot of time, it saves a lot of gas money. Um, you also have to know how to identify the species. This seems obvious enough, but this happened to us a couple weeks ago. We were out in the field. Uh, that's what this photo on the right is from. We were, we were questioning whether we were seeing Helianthus verticillatus or maybe it was Helianthus uh, grossesseratus. And so we were pretty sure it was verticillatus, but uh, these, this photo on the right is from uh, those two species that we actually have in the Austin Peak Garden. Um, I took those leaves off just as a comparison and you can it allows you to see the differences. And so we, we took a lot of photos in the field and took samples from the field and we were out there and compared it with these photos and were able to confirm that we were obviously seeing Helianthus verticillatus. Um, and then of course you gotta, you have to obtain, obtain permits before collecting anything. So whether that's landowner permission before accessing their land or if it's on public land, getting a permit from the agency. Uh, while you're in the field, these are, there's some other considerations. Um, one of them is the 10% rule. So this rule says that you don't collect more than 10% of the seeds in 10% of the years. Uh, it's, it's a very general rule and there's a lot of um, exceptions. It's kind of just, it's, it's more of just a guideline. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to bypass that rule if it makes sense. And so for this particular species is one case where you're, it might make sense to bypass that rule to some degree and maybe go for a slightly more aggressive seed collection schedule um, because it is so imperiled, um, because a lot of these populations could, could be extirpated um, in a day if something really terrible were to happen. And so it, it does make sense to have a more aggressive policy or aggressive uh, guideline in place. Uh, the reason they have that is for more, probably species that are a little more secure. Um, you don't want to collect, over collect and uh, hurt the chances of success of that population in the future. Now, obviously when you're out there, you want to have leave no trace standards, just like you would on any hiking or camping trip. Um, one of the things that is, is tempting to ignore when you're out in the field is you want to capture the genetic diversity, which means you want to collect from um, individuals that look different from another. So you want to, you don't want to only collect from the ones that are tall and have nice, big, beautiful flowers and perfectly shaped leaves or anything like that. And forget the, the smaller, uh, more rattier looking ones. You want to collect from all of them. You also want to consider collecting from plants that are in the center of the population all the way to the edge of the population. So you want to capture the full genetic diversity. And you want to collect uh, multiple times per year to make sure you're capturing those seeds that are um, maturing at the beginning of the season versus the end of the season. Uh, there is this general guideline of targeting 3,000 seeds from 50 different mothers. So mothers is essentially the, the mother plant, uh, an individual. You wanna, you wanna, throughout this whole process, it's important to keep track of the, mo the mothers, or for an introduction, if, if the purpose of the project is an introduction, you want to keep track of these the mother plants that you're collecting seed from. And you always want to keep track of that throughout the whole process. Um, obviously, for this 
Helianthus verticillatus for the world sunflower. Uh, we're, we're definitely not going to get 50 mothers in our Tennessee population just because we don't have that many individuals and probably not going to get 3,000 seeds. Uh, although that is that could be possible, I don't really predict it, but uh, it is a highly clonal species and so when you see this, this species in the wild, if you see something, it's going to look like perhaps 100 stems and you might think that's 100 individuals when really that's just one single plant that set up a lot, set up a lot of different rhizomes um, and different stems. And so it's, it is a potential, there is a potential to get a whole lot of different seeds from one single plant. Um, and then in general for uh, having, maintaining a, a species in a seed bank, you wanna collect from five different populations uh, just so you have that breadth of collection. Uh, seed banking. So once you collect the seeds, as I mentioned, you want to store them by the maternal line. You want to keep all those seeds separate. And that's helpful for uh, future purposes that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but you also want to set aside a portion of those seeds for germination testing. So uh, the, guy, the recommendation is to set aside 10% of all seeds collected and then periodically do a test of a germination just to see if the germination is accurate for those seeds. So you don't want to spend time collecting and banking seeds if you know they're not viable. And so you wanna do a germination test um, when you collect them and then at different intervals uh, throughout the seed banking period, whether it's every year, every five years, whatever it may be. Um, I should mention, so this year, um, actually really recently, we received funding from the, SGI received funding from the Garden Club of Nashville Google to establish a rare plant seed bank. And so uh, that was funding we received uh, at the end of last year and beginning of this year. Uh, we were kind of delayed in getting that established because of the pandemic. Uh, but we actually really recently completed all of our purchases and um, are really close to setting that up and having that established. And so uh, by the end of the year, we will have officially made our first uh, few collections for our rare plant seed bank that we'll continue to collect from throughout the rest of the year. And this species will be one of those species that will be seed banking. All right, so after, uh, after collecting the seed, uh, you gotta have a pro propagation plan in place. And so there's a couple things to consider here, whether you're going short-term versus long-term. Um, and what I mean by that in this case, when thinking about the, the world sunflower. So we're likely, because we don't have any uh, botanic gardens or Botanic Gardens with a conservation mission in Tennessee. We'll probably work with a partner who will help us to propagate some of the seeds, uh, grow them out, and then we'll use all of those uh, all of those propagules, all those seedlings for a specific introduction project. And so that'll be, they'll only have those seedlings in a greenhouse or wherever it may be for a short time. Um, Ideally, it would be great to establish a more long-term ex situ safeguarding site. So that's a place like a botanic garden where we could grow these seeds and kind of have established a backup population to where we have a, um, a horticulturalist at a botanic garden or something like a botanic garden where they're maintaining long-term these plants over time. Um, as with the Previous process with the seed collection, we want to maintain the maternal lines and keep those marked throughout the process. So this is these are actually world sunflower seedlings here. Um, these were grown at Mem uh, Memphis Botanic Garden. They're now they're now at Lichterman Nature Center, and one of our partners there is caring for them. But you can see there's tags in all of them. We're keeping track of individuals and populations throughout the the process of the cultivation of this species. Um, we want to aim for introducing at least 50 individuals into any given site just to increase our chances of success. Um, and let's see, one of the, uh, I meant to mention for the ex situ collection, if we were to establish a more long term collection in a botanic garden or something similar, uh, one of the benefits of that is, is it allows you to use that as a source for um, seed for any future introductions. And so you can manage that or treat it just like a natural population. You can let it pollinate itself um, and then you can harvest those seeds every year and use those for an introduction uh, at, at a later date. All right, introduction. Um, so once you've collected the seed, you've grown it out and you're ready to int introduce it into a protected and appropriately managed area. Um, 
this is sort of a, I think the longer process and the hardest one to tackle because there's a lot involved in the introduction phase. Um, there's, uh, so one of the things I have here is you want to, it's a great idea to try to design it as an experiment. So that's, that's, that's something that we're considering for the world sunflower. Um, <clears throat> we don't know a whole lot about the uh, ecological amplitude or what kind of conditions uh, this, this thing needs. It's considered an obligate wetland plant. It's got to, in other words, it has to grow at wetlands. Um, but there's some debate as to whether or not that might be true or it can survive uh, maybe somewhat drier conditions. And so one of the things that we've talked about is if we're going to do an introduction, trying to find a site that has, <clears throat> has a variety of different um, environmental conditions, such as soil moisture, so that we can measure those over time and see how the plants, the introduced plants respond. And so designing uh, an introduction as an experiment allows you to learn more about the species and uh, can inform future restoration and uh, conservation efforts. Uh, obviously, you want to establish expectations with all, with all the partners involved in the, in the beginning, especially with the landowners, whether it's a state park or elsewhere. Um, doing an introduction like this, it's not a short-term project. It's not plant them in the ground and then you're done with it. Um, there's a lot more involved and you want to make sure that the habitat is managed appropriately. So if this Helianthus particulatus, if it's going into a, a wet prairie somewhere, we want to make sure that whoever owns the land has the means and can plan on maintaining it in as that habitat over the long run, over the, the course of the species, well, really in perpetuity. Um, and so whether that's through controlled burns or through um, occasional mowings or whatever it may be, um, making sure that we're maintaining the conditions that the species need to survive and that whoever might be managing it is also on board with that. Obviously, site selection is a big deal. Um, we would need to have for this species, we think it probably needs at least somewhat wetter soils, if not more wetland conditions. But um, like I said, we can design it as an experiment and use it as an as a opportunity to learn more about the species. Uh, and then sites, <clears throat> excuse me, site prep is a big deal. So uh, I showed you that map of all of the protected areas in West Tennessee. Um, we have a few places picked out where we're going to try to um, uh, plan for an introduction. But those, those different sites are in various stages and they, they all kind of look different. And so depending on what the site looks like, you might need to do a year or two or even more than that of site prep before you can actually get to the point of planting the plants in the ground. Um, and so, for example, if it's, uh, if it's an old ag field, that maybe if it's an old soybean field, uh, you want to obviously treat all the exotics. You want to get all the exotics that may have been there um, and then establish a native flora before you actually get to the point of introducing these sunflowers. Um, same thing if it's just a, a mess of invasive species or if it's just a, maybe it is a site that is um, mostly native but has some uh, invasive species problems. You'd want to make sure that to treat those invasives and get rid of the invasives before you uh, start planting the plants out there. And so site prep can be uh, an intensive process, could be an expensive process, but it really depends on the site. Genetic considerations. So we've talked about the genetics a little bit already. Um, I'm going to skip down to that second point. But this, this plant right here, this is a single stem along a highway in Mississippi, and there were no other plants to be found. And so we talked about how this is an obligate outcrosser. Um, unless there are plants around that I wasn't able to see, I didn't spend much time looking around in the, in the greater area. There could be plants down the road or something, but um, something like this is going to need a lot of help if this specific occurrence is going to survive. Um, and so one of the things to consider is when doing an introduction, do you use propagules, seedlings, from a single source or do you mix propagules from different populations? Uh, some of the things that inform that decision are uh, genetic diversity, if it's low genetic diversity or if there are few individual differences, uh, then it might make sense to use um, seedlings from different populations. You need that outside genetic material, you need that interacting in order to um, prevent inbreeding and uh, to ensure that they can uh, breed over time. Uh, and of course, ecological differences. Um, I mentioned that uh, there's populations in Alabama 
and in Georgia. Um, being familiar with the conditions at those sites versus the conditions of our Mississippi or West Tennessee sites. Uh, the plants may be adapted differently. And so you might not want to introduce seedlings from two really different uh, ecological settings. It could end up um, resulting in outbreeding de depression, which is um, bringing in traits from one population into a different population that end up hurting it in the long run. So it might increase genetic diversity, but it, increase, it introduces traits that, um, uh, I guess, work against it, given the conditions of the site. Um, let's see, I have here the top, uh, minimize unintended hybridization. So this is more related to uh, the propagation stage. And so um, if, if you're growing plants from several different populations in a greenhouse and you have them going to flower, um, those, those plants are going to pollinate each other. They're going to likely breed with each other unless you do something to stop that. Now you might, depending on the experiment and depending on the project, that might be intended and you might want them to cross pollinate. Um, but you also might not want to if you're using these for two different introduction projects. And so uh, you want to minimize that in the propagation phase by either cutting off the flowers or bagging the flowers to ensure no pollinators visit those plants or those flowers. Um, this is a sort of complicated graph that I wanted to talk about. So uh, Erica Moore, she's a University of Memphis student, PhD student. She's working with Jennifer Mandel there. Uh, she's a faculty member there. Um, we are fortunate. To, uh, Jennifer has done a whole lot of um, population genetics work for these species. So we actually know quite a bit about the genetics of the different populations. Uh, that's, that's not always the case with a lot of our species. And a lot of times you're in the dark. But fortunately, Jennifer has been working with the species. PhD student has now picked it up. Uh, but this is a graph really just that shows the um, genetic differences between all of the populations. I added these red circles in there, but really I think the thing I want to point at is that you can see three different areas, and, and this is meant to map the, the genetic differences between all of the populations. And so you can see at the bottom there, you have uh, the McNary County population. Up at the top right, you have the Mississippi population. And in the top left, you have all the rest of the populations. And so it's interesting, you can, this can um, likely, will likely inform if we are to do an introduction where we mix propagules from different populations, this will be vital to helping us decide which uh, populations we might want to mix. And so do we want to mix the ones that have uh, similar genetic makeup or do we want to mix the, the drastically different ones? And so this, this sort of work is, and this is how genetic work can help uh, inform uh, conservation projects like this. All right, uh, and then the last stage is monitoring and management. And so after you've done the introductions, collected the seed, propagated the plants, planted them in the ground, um, there might be some sort of aftercare. So that's just, you might need to water it depending on when you're planting it and where you're planting it. That's just in the immediate short term. But always in the long run, uh, I talked about long-term management. Um, if this is a species that um, probably needs a wet prairie sort of habitat to survive. And so uh, we need the long-term management set, um, established for that to where it's gonna be managed as a wet prairie. So whether that's through controlled burns or bush hogging or whatever it may be. Um, and then monitoring the species. So we wanna monitor it after the introduction for at least three years, hopefully longer than that, uh, if resources allow, but we want to monitor it for at least a few years just to see how it survives and how it responds to the introduction. Uh, the monitoring can involve all sorts of different factors, uh, but at least you want to monitor survival growth and reproduction just to see how it performs. Uh, and that's all I've got. Um, I, that was, so a lot of that was really based on the guidelines that I showed in that Center for Plant, Plant Conservation uh, document. Um, it's, a, that it's available for free online, and so that's something that uh, I can share the link if anyone wants to take a look at it. Their website is saveplants.org, and then it should be easy to find from there. Um, there's a lot in there, a lot of details. I was trying to distill a lot of the basic stuff in here without getting too much in, in depth, but um, that's all I've got. If anyone has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to discuss more.
Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and fire away. Um, how many uh, federally listed plants are there in the state of Tennessee, uh, flowering plants, Cooper? I think it's 21. And is this um, a, a typical representative or are there some that are more on the brink of uh, being extirpated? Mm, I'd say for the federally listed species, so we have federally and state listed species. We have um, hundreds of state listed species and then 21 federally listed species. Uh, I would say of the federally listed species, this is probably among the rarest that I can think of. There might be a few others that could compete with it, but I think this one is, uh, if not the rarest, the most imperiled. A uh, couple of questions that showed up in the chat. Um, congratulations, Cooper. Uh, three exclamation points. Way to go. <laughs> uh, but, but an actual question. Uh, is the aftercare something that volunteers assist with or does it require upper level expertise? Yeah, I would say I think that'll depend on the species and the site and a lot of different things. Um, I think any step of this, any anything that I just described from seed banking and seed collection to uh, monitoring and management, I think a volunteer could potentially be involved at every step of the way. Uh, I think a lot of this stuff, especially if you're going out with others um, who have experience with it, uh, a lot of it stuff is, is not really rocket science, depending on the species and the project. Um, and I think because of the state of conservation and because we have so many rare plants and not enough people to work on them, I think it's really imperative that we uh, start getting other people involved and not just our, um, not just our traditional biologists, but having more people that have uh, an interest in this and um, relative experience with it, getting more people involved at every step of the way. And from the pictures uh, you took of the leaves, uh, I'm inferring from that that Helianthus reticulitis is growing at the Austin P uh, garden. Yeah, we have, um, I think it's just one plant there. Uh, and it, it actually has never flowered for some reason. Um, but yeah, we have one plant there. So when you're making your decision about um, how to crossbreed these different populations. It seems like that's um, part science and part experience. Um, it just seems like it'd be different for, for every uh, species you're looking at in some sense. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of art depending on the situation involved or a lot of guesswork, um, maybe a lot of guess and testing. Uh, I think it's, it's hard to predict uh, what's going to happen when you cross two populations and uh, I mean without a full genome analysis and understanding what each of those genes do uh, you can't really predict what mixing uh, mixing traits from two different populations is going to do or how it's going to take in an environment so there is a probably a fair amount of guessing and testing there so if you're, if you're cross, uh, crossing two different uh, species in the same genus, you can sometimes get into trouble with, um, let's see, what's it called? Um, anyway, where, where one, one of the species completely takes over the gene structure of the other one. Um, I forget the name of that. Uh, it starts with a P. Um, it's happening with, um, with Morris Alba and Morris Rubra as we speak, oh. um, where Morris Alba is going to be taking over wherever their range overlaps, and the same thing with um, a couple of other couple of other species. But so when you start mixing these genes up, I'm just pointing out, it's just you know afraid that you can be doing you know some kind of a, a Frankenstein experiment, and not right. really knowing how this is going to to come out. Yeah, and I, I guess I should have said that the, the default is to not cross pollination or cross populations. The default is to only uh, do any sort of uh, introduction with uh, propagules from a, from a single source. Um, it's only in those exceptional cases, which I think this could be, uh, where you would need, it might be called for to cross the populations. And I think for this one, I mean, in the long run, if we're going to see the recovery of the species, it's going to have to be introduced in a number of different sites. And I think we need to experiment both ways. I think it would make sense to experiment both ways 
And in the case where a population, you do use uh, plant material from a couple different populations, I think it needs to be monitored carefully and you can be prepared to respond accordingly if there is some sort of dire situation where you need to, I guess, reverse the decision and pull some of those plants out or something to prevent it from getting worse. Uh, so Donnie asked, what's the um, propagation method? What kind of stratification does this plant need? Um, I've got it written down. Uh, Carson Ellis, she was at Memphis Botanic Garden. She's in grad school now uh, in North Carolina, but she's the one that grew these. I don't think it's a hard species to grow. I think she stratified it maybe for, uh, I want to say it was 60 days, uh, and then just sowed it in normal seed starting mix and was able to grow it just fine. Yeah, that would be pretty standard for most of the asters, I think. 60 days cold, wet stratification. Yeah. I think that's what she did, but I've, I've got it written down. And then once you, once you have it growing, I'm pretty sure it's a, a really hardy plant. Um, I've heard people describe it as, um, I know they have it at the University of Memphis Garden. And of course, it's in a cultivated setting where maybe it's getting watered. Uh, maybe it's not, I'm not sure, but apparently it spreads and grows like crazy there. Um, Mary, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I was just wondering um, how different landowners or state parks or other agencies, um, uh, how, how receptive are they to you? Do they approach you? Do you approach them? Are they, do they greet you with open arms or do you have to convince them to help? Uh, I think it depends. I, so far, so right now we're talking about potentially introducing it um, at Pinson Mounds and at Ghost River State Natural Area, both in West Tennessee. Um, I think both of them are on board. It's just a matter of figuring out whether, how long, or if we can do the site preparation necessary to get the site ready. Um, for private landowners, I think doing an introduction on private land would, would be really just a last ditch effort. Um, I think it would be a great idea to work with private landowners to conserve the species on site, but all the ones I know of um, are really just on the edge of soybean fields or uh, and or eroded ditches where there's another land use happening. And um, I guess I haven't really, or I don't know if anyone's ever talked to them about setting aside a, a certain number of acres and taking it out of cultivation of soybeans, but uh, I don't imagine that going well. <laughs> um, we have recently though, uh, so to do, we've been trying to find more of these species. I think there's a chance that there's plenty more out there, just no one's really searched for it because it occurs in sort of these not very special areas and no one wants to go walk an agricultural ditch. Um, it's not very fun. You don't really see really unique things except for this. Uh, I think there's a possibility that there's a lot more just stragglers hanging on on these ditches or uh, roadsides in different places. And so uh, we, we went out a couple weeks ago and contacted a few landowners and there were very, one woman was extremely hesitant. I had to talk to her four times on the phone before she uh, actually allowed, allowed us onto her land. But after, after we met her or met her husband and, and went onto her land, she gave me a call afterwards and she was like, if you need to get in touch with anyone else in the area, let us know. And she was on board. So I think people are slow to trust, but then they're, then they're, uh, once you, I guess, once you earn their trust, it's, it's there for good, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, Laura, do you want to ask your question? Laura, you're on mute. I was commenting that, um, you know, you see all these spectacular things out the window and there's a couple of patches I've been admiring, just something about them looks different than all the rest. So I've been rubbernecking them. And now after listening to this, I want to go back and climb down in the ditch and get up close to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I yeah, guess, you might have um, something unique. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just convinced it's one of these, right? Treasure hunting. <laughs> so I guess, I guess I can go and, and take my, submit some observations maybe on INAT and see yeah. for sure. And, and when I hit the victory prize, I'll be calling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they found it in Virginia, it could be anywhere. Right. 
right? And well, when you, especially when you said wetlands and ditches, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm on. I know it is. I know it is. <laughs> I start doing little flips in my chair. So thank you. Okay. How much luck do you have going back in time to try to figure out um, if this uh, particular species was more widespread, say, 200 years ago? Yeah, good question. Mm. Well, I think our first observation from a herbarium specimen is from the late 1800s. And it's a single, single uh, collection from, uh, what was it? I think Henderson County. Or Chester County, Tennessee. Um, I think that's as, as good as we can do as far as knowing its historic distribution. Um, it seems like it's probably much, uh, the distribution is much less, it's probably been extirpated just because of it probably occurs in this uh, great farmland habitat. And so all of that land has been converted. And so I think that's the, the prevailing theory is most of its land has just been turned into farmland. Yeah, unless you just lucked up to a, um, a journal of some type that knew enough to ID the plant, uh, you know, by a botanist, it just seems like it's really difficult to learn the history of these uh, rare species. Mm. Yeah, the, in that Virginia population that was found last year or two years ago, I mean, some people wonder if it was introduced um, either purposefully or accidentally, and is, is really just uh, genetic material from one of these other populations and somehow made its way to Virginia. Yeah. But people or, or animals. I don't know how likely that is, but because I think it's in kind of a, it is on a roadside, I'm pretty sure, but it's in kind of a random area and it would be strange for that to happen. Go ahead, Laura. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm always wondering about the soil analysis, the soil composition. You know, I just love the microbial effect of the mycorrhizae and all that. Um, so do we do on these different populations and they're doing all the genetic analysis, but do we have soil comparisons? Um, like, like maybe that's, maybe it's something that is missing that when we're propagating, we want to be sure to have the same kind of mix? Yeah, um, I don't think that we have that information, but um, Caitlin Elam, she's the Federal Endangered Species Biologist with Division of Natural Areas. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, she's a big soils person. I know that she's gone out and looked at the soils at these sites. I don't know if we have any hard official data, but um, she at least has looked at just the structure of the soils, maybe not done an analysis, but just looked yeah. at the, the makeup of the soils and, been able to tell, at least where they occur is not really, um, not really at least now wetland soils. You may have before um, all of these little creeks were channelized and right way it could have been a wetland situation, but um, the soils themselves don't seem like they are wetland soils. Okay. Thank you. At least in some of the sites, I don't know about all of them. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I think there's a lot yet to be discovered about uh, soil and the mycorrhizal associations. Um, there was a, a Planet Native conference in Kansas City recently that had some experts that uh, managed to get it way over my head in the soil analysis. So, but they, um, there's, there's a lot of work current, there's a lot of research going on in that area right now. Yeah, that's something I've considered for other species as well. And I don't even know, I don't even know who to, to, to like reach out to. To figure I could out. send you some names from that conference. Um, <laughs> they, I think they recorded every all their all their all their talks, and uh, but there were three, there were three mycorrhizal experts uh, giving d different aspects of their presentation, and you know to the to the extent I could understand it, it seemed quite interesting and fascinating. Yeah. So I'll, I'll send you their names. Uh, cool. Maybe a link to their uh, presentation. Yeah, I think that's a. Uh... Uh, a last frontier sort of area, what's happening below the soil. Yeah. Maybe not last frontier, but. <laughs> last frontier. One we can, the, the last <laughs> one we can see from this point of view. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, Cooper, that was great. I really appreciate uh, all the information. And um, any more questions, we can um, stay here and do questions, or we can uh, visit a little longer and then uh, call it a meeting. I'm looking over the chat to see if I missed any questions. If I did, uh, speak up. Oh, Donnie says, uh, if anyone's interested, I got 10 of these seeds for world sunflower from rarepalmseeds.com and then pricey. Are you still with us, Donnie? Oh, there you are. Yeah. Yeah, I was looking at you seeds recently. Order a I have to get $30, around $27 or $28 worth, or they won't send them to you. Huh. Where, where did you say the, the seller was, or what's it called? Um, it's called rarepalmseeds.com, and I got huh. 10 of them. Interesting. 10 seeds? I don't know yet. I okay. May, <laughs> I may be stumped. I don't know. I'm going to give it a shot. Super. Yeah, I think this it is slowly making its way into um, native plant circles, and I know a lot of people have it in their gardens. Uh, I think a lot of it might have come from Jennifer Mandel's research she did when she she did her dissertation on this at Vanderbilt. Um, and I think that some of those plants have made their way into people's yards, or maybe through other means as well. They're like a dollar a seed if you get ten. They're like ten dollars mm -hmm. for ten seeds. Wonder where they get them. Yeah, I, I wonder too, and that's <laughs> scary. <laughs> this, this whole idea of ordering seeds from, not in this particular case, but in general, ordering seeds from a seed company, you know, we're just we're ending up mixing all the seeds around the country into one sort of giant uh, mega species that's you know maybe not acclimated to any one particular uh, place anymore. So, anyway. Yeah, I think the, the commercial trade of seeds like that, I think in cases like these, it's, it's where it could potentially become detrimental for the species survival in the wild if in any sort of way those different um, cultivated plants that came from God knows where ended up somehow mixing with the na native populations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that, that could be a, f a long shot. I don't know. I think the long shot of those actually crossing and having the opportunity to cross with each other is probably low, but if they did, it could be detrimental. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still tormented by not being able to remember this type of uh, uh, hybridization I was trying to think about. It's, um, anyway, the... Yeah. Uh, the Oriental bittersweet and the uh, American bittersweet are having the same uh, war where the Oriental bittersweet, each successive uh, hybrid generation is more like the Oriental bittersweet than the American bittersweet. Mm -hmm. And so it's conjectured that eventually, uh, this goes back to a paper from 2004, so it's been 16 years, but that eventually uh, in areas where those species overlap, there won't be anything remotely like the American bittersweet any longer. So anyway, I'll be up the rest of the night trying to think of that word. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rusty there, I can't help you. Yeah. Actually, it was in Doug Tallamy's most recent book, so many of you have read this word and just uh, skipped right over it. <laughs> uh, he's, he specifically talked about um, the Morris Alba, the, the red, um, red mulberry and the white mulberry and how in places where their ranges overlap the, the white mulberry is replacing the red mulberry through this hybridization process. So every, everybody's got a homework assignment. Yeah. Um, someone just commented, who was that? Nick and, Nick and Lily. Nick and Lillian. Um, mentioned the Coosa Prairies in Georgia. Yeah, so I don't know if I said this, but the Coosa Prairies, uh, there's a nature conservancy easement on, on that property in Georgia. This is where it's doing very well. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's just a, a site with a lot of clones or if it's actually reproducing and, and being really successful there. Uh, I haven't really heard about that or I don't know if they're monitoring it, but 
it's a site that's managed um, for this species and other rare species, and I'd love to go there at some point soon myself, but I haven't been there. But I, I hear there at various times you could find hundreds of stems of this, or hundreds of individuals. All right, I'm closing in on this word in Doug Callamy's book, I think. <laughs> nope. All right, I'll put it down. Um, any other questions or comments? Again, Cooper, really great presentations. I think we all enjoyed this quite a bit. So let's give Cooper a little applause there. Thank you. Unmute <laughs> and applause. Yes, exactly. <laughs> big, big thumbs up, Cooper. Thank you. Happy to do it. Great. Um, our next, just to uh, not lose this platform for, for promoting uh, future events, we do have our plant sale coming up uh, on October 10th at uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Alice Hill Nature Sanctuary. Um, I sent out to the members uh, today uh, the secret way to order plants before everybody else. And um, you can just order them and pick them up at, on Saturday. And um, if you want to also browse, you can do that as well. But some of the species, like for example, one of, well, I won't give away the name, but a few species I only have one, uh, one plant from, the, from that species. So others I've got 60. So it's, you know, it's a real crapshoot as to which, which species are going to last all the way through the, uh, the plant sale. Um, probably what the chapter will do, and I'll have to talk to the board with this, is whatever plants are left over, rather than overwinter them, there are places where we can donate them. There's some elementary schools we've been uh, working with. One is Westmead Elementary. Um, they have a native garden there, but they need help with it. So we're going to kind of adopt uh, them. There's a church we've been working with uh, that we, we could uh, probably give some plants to, but there are various organizations. Um, let's see, there's one more that I can't think of. Oh, uh, yeah, Rita Venable is involved with a project with a local church here in Franklin uh, that gives away a lot of edible food to people, but they need, they need places to house pollinators, so that's where the native plants would, would come in and, and do, do a great job. But um, I'll keep in touch and uh, let you know what happens to the leftover plants. If you, if you have a project you want to you know, propose, we'd be, the board would be happy to, to hear it, and we'll, in, we'll, invite, uh, we'll invite you to do that if we have plants left over. It's really difficult without a greenhouse to overwinter uh, plants, so um, they it's possible, but it's just, it requires a lot of effort. So we'd rather kind of minimize that if we can. Other comments, questions? Our next uh, speaker will be uh, Roger McCoy, who is the director of the uh, Division, of Nat Division of Natural Areas for TDEC. And he's going to talk about, I believe, the, uh, the white fringed orchid and the efforts, sorry, that's November. Our next speaker is actually Leslie Ann, um, blanking on her last name. Rawlings. Um, Rawlings, yeah. Uh, who teaches plant ID <laughs> classes at uh, Long Hunter State Park. And she's gonna give us a talk uh, that's just sort of the overview of how you would begin to, to ID a plant. Introgressive, Conrad, you win. Introgressive hybridization. Starts with a P, just like I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so introgressive hybridization is where each successive hybrid uh, generation that propagates with a parental species tends to shift toward one of those two parental species. It propagates selectively with one of the species versus the other. So it's a way you can actually lose a plant species through hybridization. Thank you, Conrad. Um, so um, Leslie so is going to give us... Yeah, Leslie Ann will give us an overview of plant ID, native plant IDs, and then Roger McCoy is going to talk about the, uh, the white fringed orchid in the state's efforts to save that endangered species. Uh, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, with respect to the um, plant sale the, um, that, that's coming up, um, I've been to um, Bates Nursery on White's Creek Pike and am delighted to see that they have a lot of native stuff anymore. Um, they had uh, spice bush, sweet shrub, button bush, summer sweet, fringe tree, um, hearts of burston, viburnum, those were the ones I could remember. They're, they're doing well with beginning to um, handle a lot more native stuff. 
That's, that's right. They used to be fairly hit and miss on the natives. They weren't opposed to natives, but they just didn't carry the inventory. But I think they're responding to the public shift that's slowly moving toward more native plants. And they have, uh, I've talked to two of the people there whose names I, I won't be able to remember, but they're, they're very knowledgeable about native plants and make ex, you know, very excellent recommendations to what you, can, what you should plant. So yeah, I've been happy to see the progress they've made. They're coming along. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And, uh, you know, as, as more, more people ask for native plants, uh, you know, if you're a business, you respond to the, what the people ask for. And so it's, it's good to ask for things that you would like to see there. Also, Matt at Thrive Garden Center in uh, Pegram is, um, he's carrying a lot of natives. I just bought spice bush and Carolina buckthorn and a pawpaw tree from him. Great. Good to hear. Any other questions or comments? Well, you're welcome to um, hang out and visit. Uh, but as far as the meeting goes, I'm going to stop the recording.